Hello, my name is Zoe Hunt, and welcome to Flute Talks. Uh, this afternoon, I'm here with Dory Gold. Dory is one of the founding members, um, I believe, of the EFA and former president of the Edmonton Flute Association. Good afternoon, Dory. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Okay. Um, so I wonder if you could um go into a brief history of your flute journey my flute journey uh so probably my flute journey began in grade five when my teacher in music gave us recordings to listen to different orchestral instruments and i loved the flute and so then when my junior high bands got started i thought i either want to be a drummer like karen carpenter or I wanted to play the flute. And she didn't even give me a chance to try the drums. She just put me on the flute right away and I got a sound right away. So she said, that's your instrument. Awesome. And so I was a band kid. And then from there, um, I did a degree in music therapy at Capilano College, which is now yeah. Capilano University in North Van. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah, my background is music therapy. Um, but continue to perform and teach. Um, I actually taught at CAP, uh, taught flute in the music therapy department at CAP. Um, and then, I don't know, it just kept going. And we were living in Korea uh, for about 10 years. And while I was there, I had a chance to do my diploma with the ABRSM. So I did my diploma in flute performance and just started teaching more and more and more and doing less music therapy. And then I just felt that um, flute was my forte more so than music therapy. And mm -hmm. so left that career behind and just do well, flute from- So tell me that the, the um, teaching that you do now, do you at all transfer the music therapy into your teaching lessons or is that something completely different? I would not say that I work as a therapist in any way, shape or form as okay. a teacher, but I would say the skills I gained as a music therapist definitely impact my teaching um, because of the, the communication skills that are so focused on the understanding of the educational process that and how the brain works, uh, working with groups, um, families, all that stuff. The skills I gained as a music therapist definitely improve. Yeah, yeah. yeah improve my skills as a, as a teacher, I think. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks. Um, can you tell me about the EFA and how that came to um, start? What are the, because you're- So the EFA, mm -hmm. the EFA was uh, cooking in my brain, probably from uh, about, oh, I don't know, 2005, uh, after moving to this area, um, I just kept looking with with uh, a little bit of jealousy to the states and how they have these wonderful flute associations and flute associations can bring in workshops and teachers right. and, and networking. And I kept thinking, we need this in Edmonton. We need this. This would be terrific. So um, I took some time this morning <laughs> to try and figure out the dates because, you know, things just sort of flow. and. I'm like, was it 2016? Yes, it was 2016. So in December of 2016, I, um, I said, you know what, I, I, think, I think the time's ripe. We're just going to try something. So I sent out an email to every flute player I knew in the area and invited them to a coffee morning. Um, and we had a, a Christmas coffee morning and play-in uh, hosted by the school I was working at at the time, Taylor Conservatory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, about 14 people showed up wow. and we had a wonderful time and we had a brief meeting discussing, would this be something people wanted to do? And it was overwhelmingly yes. So mm -hmm. then um, I think it was, we, well, we set up a committee anyway, so to, to look into how to be a nonprofit and Leanne Gaynor, uh, gave us incredible help on that. Um, and then uh, we hosted a meeting. Lisa Nelson was in town. 
uh, giving a master class. And so Shelly Young stepped forward and said, hey, why don't we merge this master class at U of A together with another meeting cool. to, yeah. uh, to an inaugural meeting to get a, a name and to get all the votes in that we needed to move ahead to be a nonprofit. Awesome. Got that done. That was wonderful. And then um, uh, got all the paperwork done and had our first AGM in 2017. Oh my goodness. 2017 was our first AGM. Okay, so you were the pioneer. You were really the founding mm -hmm. member. Okay, that's what I thought, you know, so I'm glad yeah. to, to know that. And it's now on record. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Got you. <laughs> it's official. I'm the one that kind of said, let's do this. And then, but like, it couldn't have happened. Um, if yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Not said, yes, this is what yeah, we, we got. Want. You. <laughs> Um, right. And, and so, and, and, and so many people came forward to do that, you know. But what does a flute association, sorry, mean to you? What does it mean? Well, to me, it means community, mm -hmm. um, and, and a way for us to work together to bring good happenings to Edmonton. Okay. Uh, outreach, um, right. getting to know each other. Uh, one of the one of the reasons in my mind for having it happen was sometimes people would come to town um, and we were all phoning each other, emailing frantically, so-and-so's coming to town, there's going to be a workshop. <laughs> to get that out there to, mm -hmm. our, to the teachers, to the students, to the performers. Like the so it was a challenge. So, so important. And I can't say that, that we've always nailed it since we've become an association. But we have had such great things happen and, mm -hmm. and been able to get the word out to so many people because we have the association. It's fluid. Yeah, it's a lot easier. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, so you told us a bit about teaching, just going through um, all the questions yeah. here as well. So you've been teaching for... Um, for a while. Um, through the pandemic, how has um, that been for you for teaching? Well, I actually started teaching online about five years ago. So um, I've taught in person and online um, for a lot longer than the pandemic. Um, so I had that experience already of what teaching online was like. Um, so that helped a lot in terms of the transition. Um, I think the biggest thing was the abruptness and how fast we had to transition mm -hmm. when the lockdown happened. It was like, boom, I went from teaching in person on Friday to teaching the full, you know, all 30 Nine. students Nine. Monday, started on Monday and getting them used to, to how things worked online, getting the parents used to it. Um, it was hard at the beginning to do the full studio. I just found I got really, really tired. And I think lots of people mm. had that experience. Um, but because of the way school was set up and the majority of my students are school kids, yeah. um, I just started putting more rest breaks I see. between okay. students to give my eyes a rest. And to be honest, um, Oddly enough for me, my eyes were tired, but it was my legs that got really, really tired. Right. Um, yeah, which is really funny. But uh, at my studio, the flooring was different than at my house. So oh, <laughs> I had to look at, at some ergonomic mats and things like that mm -hmm. uh, because that was very energy draining having sore legs. So it tells me that you are standing the whole time. I was standing more than I would, and I realized part of it was because I was on the computer. Mm. Um, I have, I have, um, I have neck issues for when that that show up when I play sitting. Oh, so I see. In order to demonstrate, I was standing a lot more, and I had to really retrain myself. Um, oh. So teach some teaching strategies were a little bit different. But, you know, um, I, I guess the question is, like, I'm looking at from sort of how did teaching change 
with pandemic, but it's more a teaching change through being absolutely online to being right. occasionally online. Because uh -huh. I just had a couple of students online prior to that. Okay, I see, I see. Um, so the the good part about that is you had um, you had the idea of how things would work, and you had a system set up in place. So. Um, yeah. What what is the major difference between pandemic teaching versus um, face to face? Like, is there is the routine different, or is it? No, um, I've. I mean, obviously, the main difference is that you're not in the room together. So, you you have to rely a lot more on your verbal skills and your ability to explain things really clearly because you can't um, pick up on those nonverbal cues. I, that I do want this. Yeah, for sure. That, that's probably the biggest one. So it's a little harder to tell if a student's tired or had a rough day or they're feeling really good and super energetic. You really have to rely on um, the, the relationship you have with them that they'll let you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then every cue you can pick up. So it's like, oh, you know, this person is a little off today. I wonder, I wonder. And then you say, so, so how are you doing? How was your day? And then you find out. Whereas in person, maybe they walk through the room and you can tell right away, wow, they this is a kid, like get the tissue box out because something's up, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, not that that happens all that often, but mm -hmm. you just don't have that uh, that extra body language to help you when mm -hmm. you're teaching online. Um, I haven't had a lot of issues uh, with with hearing the tone, hearing the vibrato, stuff like that. I've got a really good setup. So that's never been an issue. The one thing I do find, though, with working on breathing, I always have to figure out how I'm going to set up the camera so that, you know, they can see what I'm doing when I'm demonstrating mm -hmm. stuff like mm -hmm. that. But overall, I think it's been actually quite empowering. And, and I think, I think my teaching has improved a lot in terms of verbal communication. Cool. I've gotten, That's great. That's you know, you get so yeah. good at it. This is how to explain it. And this is the question to ask. Right, right. Um, because that's all we've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's um, virtual communication and you're trying to put the emotion um, and the reality more into it now. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, um, I want to say picky, but it's, not, it's very precise. It like it's, it's, it's extremely um, precise. Online teaching. Yeah, and I thought I was pretty good at it, but having having all of them <laughs> on for a full year, it's like, oh yeah, this is a better way to explain it. Mm -hmm. They get it. This is, you know, especially with 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 sort of because flute is very physical, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So trying to explain where your air is going and and how can they experience where their air is going when I I have. And I, I can't go to my desk and pull, pull out a tool and say, here, here you go. They've got to do it on their end to figure yeah, it out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's been really interesting, actually. Cool. Okay, on that note, on a similar note, um, there are five questions that we, that we routinely ask. So one of them is, how do you um, practice? yourself um how how do you do scales how do you teach um and what are what are some of the techniques that you use for both uh, yourself and for teaching oh okay so do you want to divide that up a little bit yeah let's divide that up okay yeah <laughs> thank you no. <laughs> So first of all, um, how do you teach? What is the routine of, of teaching? Okay. Um, I really individualize the teaching strategy for each student um, because they all have unique needs and, and I have the, you know, the experience and the expertise to do that. So I wouldn't say 
that there's a routine. Um, we definitely, even with the little ones, you, you're working on um, the technique behind sound production, the, the technique behind behind good breathing, mm -hmm. rhythm, uh, rhythm, boy, doesn't matter how, how advanced you are. There's always rhythm and I love teaching rhythm. Um, but I think it's more diagnosing where that person's at and then selecting the strategies that fit their unique position and, and, and potential. And, and sometimes that's, um, that's sort of taking into account where they're at as a person as well. Definitely mm -hmm. teaching a little nine-year-old is quite different from teaching a retiree who maybe has returned to the flute after a long time. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, great. And then how do you um, practice yourself? I definitely practice more in the summer. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> in summer, summer, I change my time and in the summer I practice in the morning. And so I spend more time practicing in but those months, uh, in the, when I'm my regular teaching schedule, I usually don't start practicing till maybe two or three in the afternoon, mm -hmm. depending on what time I start teaching. Um, I think that the number one thing I always do, um, is I do long tones with humming. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it just opens up the sound okay. really, okay. really opens up the sound. And that's something, um, I, I worked on with Lorna McGee at Pender Island Flute Retreat. Um, and that was just like a hugely eye opening, um, technique. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. I do that pretty much every day. Like, I also do head joint sounds before I put my flute together. Mm -hmm. I always, I, I work on my head joint for a while, um, doing harmonics, doing uh, vibrato, whatever on my head joint. Then I put the flute together and, and, um, and I do humming with long tones. With the head joint, do you um, close the end of the head joint or do you put your finger in? And uh, I usually actually, actually neither. Uh, okay. <laughs> I usually just play it open and I work on octave. It's not truly octaves, but, but up and down, yeah. up and down. And then I really like it for vibrato work. Oh, really? Okay. Because it's quite torturous for vibrato work. So okay. depending on the day, I will plug it for vibrato. Nice. Um, but I also like to work with vibrato using just the metronome. Mm. Um, and just work at increasing the speed serious technique okay good yeah yeah I, I I'm one of those people I have to really work on on my vibrato all the time um and then to be honest uh it just depends on what my students are doing um and what if I have a concert coming up I haven't done any concerts lately uh because of COVID but my my duo and um I work with Tyson Outway in a duo called the Northern Lights Duo, and we're, we're starting to work again on our stuff. So that's going to be coming out of the drawer and, and getting onto the stand. But mostly this year, it's been, I always do studies. I love studies. Mm -hmm. I love studies. Yeah, who's your favorite um, composer for studies? If you have one. Oh. <laughs> There's a few. Probably Kohler. Oh, really? And I know I don't say his name right. I have a German friend of mine said it's something like Kohler. Okay. Kohler. Um, yeah, I love the the way uh, a good study, you're just so drawn into it so completely and you're completely in the moment. Mm -hmm. like, I really, really enjoy that. And sometimes I like just taking like like the simple ones and just playing them really, really fast and whipping through them. And it's just really satisfying. Nice. So I'd say that's sort of, you know, long tones and, and scales. I like Rikert the best. In fact, I've got him on my stand for, for, um, for good technique work. I really enjoy that. Every so often I do a bit of Tafno and Gobert, most in the summer. Okay. It's Gobert because it's a little more time consuming. And then for but, your flute students, you practice their music to 
Yeah, I've got to go through their music. And right now I've got a lot of, lot of people, you know, in the higher levels. So okay. this winter has been a lot of, of um, you know, Inesco and Iber and Poulenc and people like that. So, and, but that, I don't consider that practicing so much. It's more going through it and making decisions about how I'm going to teach specific aspects. Interesting. Well, that's right. good, you know. So if, if I know on Wednesday morning, we're going to be looking at the third movement of the Poulenc, I'll go through it and I'll think, think through a little bit more, say the fingering, or I know that this particular student's going to, we, we need to work really a lot on one section. So I'll figure out what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So that's more my preparation as opposed to working on their music. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, any tips or, or tricks that you've learned along the way? Um, that humming exercise. Mm. That I was about. Yep, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's an extended technique, but it is just phenomenal for, for, for opening up our sound. Now you have an Instagram account. Is that right? I do. I have two. I have okay. two. So I've, I've got my, um, my own, which is the business account, Dory Gold Flute. Okay. But I also have Yeg Flute. And Yeg Flute is an account for whenever I see something of interest to Edmonton flute players. Um, okay. okay. I just post. So EFA stuff's up on there. Um, whoever I hear from. Depends on who I hear from. Great. So that's um, Y-E-G Flute? At y -E -G flute? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, also the Dory Gold flute. Um, you have some tips and things on that I've, I've seen. I've looked into that. and Yeah, sometimes I, it depends on uh, what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I've got some stuff up on there. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. That's really interesting to, to kind of get different um, ideas and, and techniques and things to work on there. They're, uh, they're really fun. I've, I've looked at it myself and. and oh, that's it. nice. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No problem. Um, and, oh, here's a question. So what is something most people don't know about you, Dory? Oh, I asked my husband about that. Cause I'm like, what don't people know about me? <laughs> well, <he's laughs> everything. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think a lot of people don't know that I like to cook Korean food. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I make really good bulgogi. And for Easter, we're having chapte and a special <laughs> rice noodle wrapped in bacon thing that my kids love. Um, I've never, I do basic Korean food, but it is very delicious. I just never mastered kimchi. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a challenge. Uh, my friend does that. My friend. Um, yeah. And my sister-in-law makes her own and I keep saying, ah, eh, maybe one day, but we don't eat it enough. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it's always a specialty dinner, right? So, um, when my kids were younger, we probably had Korean food once a week and I learned the recipes I wanted to do. And now I've kind of settled into my core but having lived there you know we lived there a long time and how long did you live there for here. pardon me how long did you live there we were there nine and a half years oh my gosh yeah yeah nine and a half years and uh i never learned to cook korean food while i was there while you were there oh, okay oh, so then we moved <laughs> here and it was like oh my gosh i miss korean food so much <laughs> so thankfully some friends shared some wonderful recipes with me and uh yeah so that's something i like to cook and korean food is my probably something people don't know about me excellent <laughs> unless they've been invited over for dinner which doesn't happen <laughs> now at all <laughs> right right mm -hmm. okay um well i think those are all of the questions that will um will keep us um I think those are all the questions that we went through. So um, yeah, thank you very much for taking the time today to-, yeah, to you're welcome. welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, yeah, so I just wanna say thank you to the Alberta Flute Association. Um, 
the Edmonton Flute Association yes. for giving us this opportunity and to um, the Alberta Arts Foundation. 